but tell to the coming generations the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob. He appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, that they would arise and tell their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Those are the first eight verses of Psalm 78, where Truth 78 takes our name. And the main point of those eight verses is that we've been entrusted with the truth about God, all that he is, all that he has done, and we have to pass that truth on to the next generation. He established a testimony in Jacob. He appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children. This testimony is the word of God, and that's why we're doing this conference this weekend and why we are focusing on biblical literacy. We believe that the command to teach the truth of God's word to the next generation is on us all as God's people. Every generation has that, what we call the Psalm 78 mandate upon us to faithfully take what we've been given that our fathers have told us, verse 3 of Psalm 78, and to teach them to our children. This process of passing truth on is a crucial component in the discipleship of the next generation in the hope that we might, with the Apostle Paul, present everyone mature in Christ. And we've been working um, over the years to try to capture the heartbeat of our ministry into fewer words. You know, when we started out, it took us about four and a half hours to try to unpack everything that we were trying to do. And uh, about a month ago, we uh, went off before our, our leadership team went off about uh, an hour southwest of here and uh, trying to come up with a shorter, a briefer way to say it. And uh, the way we're saying it now is, as far as defining True 78, is simply we're zealous for the discipleship of the next generation. That's what we're after. And uh, the d discipleship of the next generation is what we believe defines us as an organization. It defines our mission. It's what we're passionate about and what we're committed to. And why are we committed to that? Um, the aim we find in verse 6 and 7 is so that the next generation will put their hope in God and not in anything else, not in the things that the world that they're growing up in would have them put their hope in. In fact, we're dreaming these days about um, building a network of churches and institutions, organizations who care about these things. Um, I hope a year from now you'd be able to go on our website and see a list of Psalm 78 churches who are committed, zealous for the discipleship of the next generation. And so in pursuing that hope that uh, we have, we've identified seven, and we're still, this is just about a month old, okay, so we're still trying to come up with words, seven goals seven priorities, seven objectives. Uh, we thought of seven marks, but we thought our friends in Washington, D.C. wouldn't <laughs> like that as much. And uh, we had to come up with something for today. So uh, the word today is seven commitments of a Psalm 78 person, a Psalm 78 church, a Psalm 78 
organization. And if you, if you think of a good word, you're going to get um, a follow-up email this afternoon that's kind of an evaluation. And if you've got a better word for this, give it to us because this is the great, all this is starting still in the formative phase. And, uh, and even what these seven commitments are, are still, we're trying to work on wording. But the first commitment that we want to emphasize is a commitment to embrace a biblical vision for the faith of the next generation. At Truth 78, we believe that the discipleship of the next generation, both in the church and in the home, should be shaped and oriented around a shared vision for the next generation. This vision is what gives purpose and direction to all of our discipleship efforts at home and in church. When our discipleship efforts are guided by a vision for the next generation, we can answer questions like, what do we want to be true for our children 10, 20, 30 years from now? What do we want our children to know and understand about God and his word 20 years from now? What do we want them to understand about the gospel? What marks of faith and spiritual maturity do we want them to have? What portions of the Bible do we want them to be able to quote from memory by the time they graduate from high school? What kind of husband or father or what kind of wife and mother do we want them to be? What would we want them to respond or how would we want them to respond when tragedy comes upon their lives, when they face the sufferings in, that will inevitably come in their lives? The very nature of discipleship and the discipleship effort implies that there are goals like this. And what we've observed over the years in churches is that there's often an ability within the church, within the home, uh, for us to be able to express our heart's desire for our children. Um, we have a desire to reach the next generation, we'll say, or we want a desire to reach children. Or my mother, uh, I remember just, said, she would say, I'm just so grateful to God that all my children love the Lord. And her heart was that her children, our, and my dad's children, us, would grow up in a home and, uh, and in the end, love the Lord. And that's a, that's a glorious vision. But so often, accompany, there's not a com always accompanying that desire any kind of intentional or strategic plan to get them there. And it's that plan that we're saying we should have. We should have a clear vision and an understanding of how to get there. Children will often come to our churches. They'll be involved in activities and programs in the church, but those activities are not necessarily linked to any specific discipleship goal or purpose. We've been calling that over the years an activity orientation that emphasizes the things we do in our home or in our churches, um, like we do a well-equipped nursery, or we have a well-equipped nursery, or Sunday school for all ages, and a wide range of programs for children and youth on Wednesday nights. And a, dis a vision-oriented church will have those same things. They will have a well-equipped nursery, Sunday school for all ages, and a wide range of programs. But what they emphasize, what a Psalm 78 church will emphasize is the fruit that they hope will come from all of those activities. Namely, they will have a vision for what those children and youth growing up in their church will be like. For example, we want them to be mighty men and women of faith. We want them to love the word and to learn to live by it. We want them to have a faith that can stand through seasons of difficulty and suffering. We want them to have a big view of God who rules the universe and who upholds the universe by the word of his power. We want them to know and honor and treasure Jesus Christ. 
want them to be radically sold out to spreading a passion for the supremacy of God in all things for the joy of all people. We want them to become parents who know how to lead their children on the path that leads to life. And we want them to have a God-centered, Christ-exalting, Bible-saturated view of themselves and the world that surrounds them. In fact, in both the churches that I've had the privilege of serving and leading in children's ministry, youth ministry, we've um, kind of came up with an eight-point vision statement that kind of defined what it was. When we put our kids out 20 years, what is it that we would, how would we describe them? And this, um, these are John Piper hyphenated expressions that he's so good at, and we just sort of observe that. So God-centered, Christ-exalting, spirit-dependent, Bible-saturated, doctrinally grounded, faith-filled, spiritually mature, mission-minded men and women of God who are spreading a passion for the supremacy of God and all things for the joy of all people. That, that's how we try to put into a, into a simple, relatively simple statement what it was that we were aiming for. It's what we prayed for our children would become. And it defined our ministry over the years. Our hope was that everyone then in the church who was raising children, in fact, if you go in the college park in the children's area, um, we've got those eight points, hyphenated points, up on the wall so that parents, teachers, as they're walking by, can see this is what we're aiming for. Now, we don't have time in this session to unpack all of those eight points hyphenated words, but we couldn't resist emphasizing two that have it's been especially impactful in shaping Truth 78. The first is God-centered, and the second, especially with the focus on biblical literacy, the second is Bible-saturated. We want to raise our children with a God-centered orientation on life in a world that is so self-centered in its orientation. We want our children to understand that God is the center of the universe. He is the sun around which everything orbits. All of life revolves around his sovereign care and purposes. Listen to Romans 11.36. From him, through him, to him are all things. To him be the glory. Everything in the universe points to God. Everything reveals his glory. Everything in the universe exists by his sustaining grace. Everything was created by the word of his power. Every molecule is sustained. Every atom is fixed. Every orbit is maintained. Every breath we take, every drop of water we drink comes directly from the hand of God. Were God to with hold his grace for a millisecond, the entire universe would vanish. Listen to Isaiah 40, 21 and 22. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. Or a couple verses later, to whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their hosts by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might. And because he is strong, in power, not one is missing. The whole universe, every single one of us, exists for God. God does not exist for us. We exist for him. So we must be very careful not to distract our children from God by emphasizing their own little kingdoms of self-interest, self-indulgence, self-centeredness. We live in a therapeutic culture that continually focuses on my feelings, my hurts, 
my rights, my past, my goals, my desires, my ego, my self-concept. We live in a self-focused world that is all about me. It is in the air we breathe and it's in our own hearts which are prone to worship the created rather than the creator. Paul Tripp rehearses this theme over and over in his books, Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands, A War of Words, and A Quest for More. Here are some quotes. Sin causes us to steal the story of God and rewrite it with ourselves as the lead and our lives at center stage. But there is only one stage, and it belongs to the Lord. Any attempt to put ourselves in his place puts us at a war with him. It is an intensely vertical war, a fight for divine glory, a plot to take the very position of God. It is the drama that lies behind every sad earthly drama. Sin has made us glory robbers. You and I have been born into a world that by its very nature is a celebration of the glory of another. I am not the center of my world. God is. The fulfilling of my desires and needs is not the most important thing in the world. God's will is. Each of our lives is shaped by the war between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of self. And this is the war into which every child is born. And it's our job as parents and as children's ministry leaders to consistently point them beyond themselves to God, to help them see that all of life is related to God, that every decision they make, every word they speak, every desire they have is either shaped by a love of self or a love of God. This is a very countercultural message in our world because we live in a world that gives our children messages like this. These are actual t-shirts. Scientists agree, I am the center of the universe. Awesome ends with me. Please don't buy those t-shirts for your children or grandchildren. <laughs> we and our children are not awesome. We are not the center of the universe. We are poor and needy and sinful and we need a savior. And our children must come to understand the reality of their desperate situation and marvel that an awesome God would care for them and send his son to die for them. Our job is not to build up our children with pride, self-sufficiency, and self-glorification, but to build them up with a biblical awareness and understanding of God and humble dependence on him for all things. For our children to have a God-centered understanding of this world, it is crucial they have a God-centered understanding of the Bible. Because the Bible is first and foremost a book about God and his glory. The Bible's not about Abraham, Moses, David, or Daniel. It's about God. These other men merely point to God. Verse 4 of Psalm 78 declares, We will not hide them from our children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. God can be hidden to our children by the way we teach our children. One way we do this is by putting the biblical character at the center of the story instead of God. So contemplate these Bible story titles. Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream. Miriam watches over her baby brother. Moses parts the Red Sea. Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho. David kills the giant. Peter and John heal the lame man. Consider this version of the story of Esther. This is very common in children's material. Brave Queen Esther was to go in and plead with the king for the lives of her people. Because the king listened to beautiful, brave Esther, the Jews were kept from destruction. To tell the story this way conceals the glory of God from our children. The, story, the book of Esther is not about a brave queen. It is a story of a faithful, covenant-keeping God who preserved his people. God was the one that put Esther in a strategic position in the king's court. God was the one that gave Esther favor with the king. And God was the one that turns the king's heart to the Jews. He happened to choose to work through Esther, but deliverance could have come some other way. God can use anyone and anything to accomplish his purposes. God is the one who orchestrates history, not us. 
So to replace the story of God's faithfulness to his people in Persia for the story of a brave and beautiful queen robs God of his glory that is rightfully his and exchanges it for the praise of man. In the same way, the story of God dealing justly with a rebellious world by a flood is not the story of Noah and the animals that went two by two into the ark. To focus on this story, on the story on who built the ark and about lions and camels and kangaroos hides the glory of God that is revealed in that story. There is a way to tell Bible stories that magnifies God's glory, and there is a way to tell the Bible stories that rob God of his glory, to hide God from our children. Another way that we do this is by turning the truth of God's word that is meant to reveal who God is and use it for moral instruction. For example, David facing Goliath is used to teach children to have courage. Moses in the bulrushes becomes a lesson on helpfulness. Miriam helped her mother by watching her baby brother in the Nile. And the feeding of the 5,000 becomes a lesson on sharing. This is a sample from a finger play book. When Jesus asked for food to share, a very little boy brought forth his fish and loaves of bread and saw with utmost joy how Jesus gave to everyone. Thousands were well fed because one very little boy shared his fish and bread. Really, 5,000 people were fed because a little boy shared his fish and bread? 5,000 people were fed because Jesus is the Son of God. The feeding of the 5,000 is not the story of a little boy sharing his lunch. It's the story of Jesus having compassion on the crowd, seeing both their physical need, their spiritual need, taking what he had, giving thanks to the Father, and miraculously multiplying it because he is the Son of God, and he is all-powerful and sufficient to satisfy all of man's longings. The story of Moses is not the story of a big sister being helpful by taking care of a little brother who grows up to divide the Red Sea. It is a story of the sovereign God of the universe declaring his glory among the Egyptians and imposing his will upon them. Listen to Exodus 7, 5, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. It is the story of God revealing his glory to Israel and to us. Then I will take you from my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. It is a story of God defeating Satan's evil scheme by delivering his people with his mighty arm because he is all-powerful, and he always accomplishes his purposes. The Bible does teach us to live godly lives, and many of the Bible stories do show us good or bad morals. But to reduce Bible stories to this is to hide the person and work of God to our children. Because the aim of the Bible is to first draw our attention to God, to worship him, and to see his unsurpassed character. Observe the purpose or the reason why we are to teach the next generation, signified by the word, so that, in verse 7 of Psalm 78, so that they should set their hope in God so that they should not forget the works of God, so that they should keep his commandments. However, if God is hidden, if our children miss seeing the glorious deeds of the Lord and have no functional understanding of his might and the wonders that he has done, if they don't come to see and understand God for who he really is, how will our children ever set their hope in him? We have to see how we unwittingly hide God from our children by neglecting God as the main character of every Bible story. So, God-centered and another vision phrase is that they be Bible-saturated. We've taken our theme for this conference from 2 Timothy 3.15 where Paul reminds Timothy that you've known these things about God from childhood. You've been equated with the sacred writings. You've been acquainted with the Bible. Timothy was blessed to have a mother and a grandmother who felt this responsibility to take this testimony that they had been given and in the spirit of Psalm 78 faithfully pass it on to Timothy. 
And in the next verse, Paul affirms that these sacred writings, this testimony, was breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And this is what we trust the next generation, our children, will experience, that they will experience from childhood being taught the word of God and that they will find that word profitable. And so our aim in this effort is to, uh, much like a sponge, immerse our children into the word of God and saturate them with the word of God so that their life takes on the qualities of the Bible. They, they drip Bible when you interact with them. They, their thoughts, their ideas, their world view is colored and shaped by the Bible itself. Bible-saturated people have a biblical way of thinking and behaving. The Bible shapes all of their desires and all of their perspectives. Whenever they face um, whatever situation that they face, Bible-saturated people respond in a way that is influenced by God's word. When they are squeezed by the adversity of life, they drip Bible. When they are pricked by painful circumstances, they bleed Bible. Everything that they observe, everything that they are taught are viewed through biblical lenses and or through a biblical lens. The opinions that they have, the, the decisions that they're making, the conclusions they come to should all be shaped and influenced by the word of God. Bible saturated people will look for answers to the questions of life in the book of life. So there's three principles that we want to lay out that guide us in raising a generation of Bible-saturated people. The first is use, use the Bible when you're teaching the Bible to children. It may seem obvious that we should do this, but you, can, you would be surprised how difficult it can be to find a Bible in the Sunday school rooms of many of our churches and yet, if we're serious about teaching the Bible to our children, if we want our children to be guided by this book, and if we're serious about giving them a biblical vision of God and a biblical worldview, and if we want them to have a biblical response to the cultural pressures and a biblical understanding of themselves, if we're serious about them being a Bible-saturated generation, then we should give some consideration to the place that this book, the Bible itself, has in our homes and in our churches and in our ministries of the church. The absence of the Bible in the Sunday school classroom and the limited visibility that it can have and its use can have in the home makes us wonder, are we really teaching children the Bible or are we just teaching them lessons? Are our children becoming biblically literate? Do they know how to use their Bible? Have they learned how to find things in it? When it's assumed that the Bible by itself is a boring book and too difficult for them to really understand, often the book then becomes neglected. But when children are taught the breadth and the depth of scripture, and they're taught how to personally interact with the word, when they're looking up verses and they're reading them and they're thinking about what they have read and they're answering questions about a text and determining the meaning that that text have, has, the Bible is not boring when they're interacting with the Bible. And when they discover biblical truths for themselves, they're more likely to be transformed by it. Instilling in our children the habit of turning to the Bible for answers is a significant step forward in raising a Bible-saturated generation. Number two, teach true doctrine. You know, for centuries, the church used catechism to systematically ground children in biblical doctrine. But the church, for the most part, has abandoned the use of catechism and with very little serious thought is given to the doctrinal instruction of children. But understanding the core doctrines of the Bible is essential for becoming firmly established as a mature Christian. 
The doctrines reinforce right thinking about God and about ourselves and the world we live in. Having a solid doctrinal foundation will serve to guard the next generation against false teaching and ungodly living. John Piper makes this point clear in his sermon titled, Contend for the Faith. If our stress on the personal relationship with Jesus leads us to deny that there is a set of truths essential to Christianity, we make a grave mistake. There are truths about God and Christ and man and the church and the world which are not merely, which are essential to the life of Christianity. If they are lost or distorted, the result will not merely be wrong ideas, but misplaced trust. The inner life of faith is not independent from the doctrinal statement of faith. When doctrine goes bad, so do hearts. There is a body of doctrine which must be preserved. And Truth 78 is committed to systematically and clearly teaching children a correct and robust theology through the scope and sequence of our curriculum. We want to ground the children in the next generation in sound doctrinal truths, even the difficult ones like God's sovereignty, his judgment, human suffering, and the existence of evil, so that the next generation will have a firm place to stand when their faith is tested through times of trial and suffering and all the storms of life. Over the years as a pastor, uh, I've encountered several people who have come against the winds of adversity and difficulty and suffering, the kind of people who grow up thinking, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, and he does. But when the first struggle comes, sometimes that faith, that, um, that idea of God gets challenged, and they begin to wonder, is any of this real? Is God even real? And so we want our children to be able to grow up um, confident that they're going to face trouble. Trouble will come. In the world, Jesus says, you will have trouble. And uh, that trouble comes, and when it comes, when those storms start beating against their house, we want them on a rock that will not be shaken. And if we're not careful in our instruction of our children, we can unwittingly teach them false doctrine. We can lead our children into wrong thinking about God and about man and faith in the Christian life. For example, a teacher might say in an effort to encourage children, um, you know, Jesus called his disciples because he needed helpers. And you can be Jesus' helper, too. How about that? Little first grader, you can be a helper to Jesus. Now, I get the heart desire that that teacher has, and it may seem harmless, but when you think about it, what is, there, what is that teacher saying about God? That Jesus is so limited and so weak in his capacity that he needs helpers. And he's so needy that he's looking to a first grader to help him. <laughs> that is not the biblical view of Jesus Christ. Acts 17 gives us a true picture of God and his son. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Now, who do you want to turn to in a crisis? Do you want to turn to the one who holds everything by the word of his power, who gives to everything life and breath and being, or do you want to turn to a first grader for help or to a Jesus who needs a first grader for help? In their book, uh, Instructing a Child's Heart, I commend it to you, Ted and Margie Tripp uh, make this statement that captures the heart and the mission of Truth 78. They said, quote, we give our children big truths that they will grow into rather than light explanations that they will grow out of. We, the problem with those people who struggle in my office 
It's because they've had such a small view of who God is that he exists to make me happy. He exists to make me comfortable. And it's not that God has forsaken them or God is evil to bring all this suffering. It's just because they've had a, a distorted view of who God is. Big biblical truth is not difficult for our children to embrace, and it's certainly not boring for our children. The Bible is not boring because God is not boring. We have a God who opens seas. We have a God who defeats a giant through a boy with a sling and a stone. We have a God who makes the sun stand still. We have a God who sends hailstones on the enemy and pays his taxes out of a fish's mouth. We have a God who defeats an enormous army using 300 men with lanterns and trumpets. We have a God who makes the walls of a city fall down. We have a God who heals paralyzed people and who walks on water. God is not boring. We have the most exciting story in the world to share with our children. Why would we replace it with silliness that offers no life to our children? So let's embrace this Psalm 78 admonition not to hide the testimonies of God from our children, but tell the coming generation to come the glorious deeds of the Lord. Let's give words of life to our children. Let's presume that God is able to work in their hearts and bring about a love for his word and an eagerness to hear deep truth. Let's help them see the living God of the universe as he has revealed himself through his book. Let's protect our children from their ancient foe by putting a sword in their hands and teaching them how to use it. Let's tell the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and the wondrous works that he has done and is still doing today. Three, inspire and challenge children to memorize the Bible. When our children memorize portions of the Bible, they have immediate access to the biblical truth beyond the biblical lesson that is taught to them. When the word is memorized, it's running in the back of a child's mind and creates the opportunity for children to meditate on the truths of God's word. Now, we don't talk about meditation much today, but it can have a powerful, heart-changing impact on our souls. This is what Lou Priolo says, meditation fastens into our hearts truths which we've received but have not yet assimilated into our character. Meditation is a means the Spirit of God effectively uses to permeate, permanently amalgamate into our character that truth which previously we may have only received intellectually or superficially, truth that had not been digested and become part of our makeup. You know, we live in a fast-paced electronic age, and it gives very little opportunity to meditate. It doesn't encourage meditate on anything, much less on the scripture. To memorize the word of God is to have it on the tip of our tongue so that it becomes the hum in the back of our minds. It's that which our mind slips into when it's in neutral. It's what we go to bed thinking about. When that happens, we're moving toward being Bible saturated. We can go to bed sleeping. You can go to sleep meditating on the word of God. Our idle monuments can be spent in reflection. When temptation arises, there is a word of truth or conviction or power to help us fight the fight of faith. The memorized word also provides our children with biblical language for their prayers and worship. You know, just like adults, children can get stuck in a rut when they pray, saying things like, without even thinking every night, thank you for the nice day, please watch over us tonight, or meal time, thank you for the good food. And, you know, just repeating common phrases with little thought. But children will pray differently when they have their minds, uh, in their minds, biblical words that can inform and shape their prayers. Now, several years ago, I had the opportunity to observe a sixth grade class during their worship time. And the worship leader asked the students to pray by completing the phrase, God, you are so good because. And I was amazed at what I heard. God, you are so good because... While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God, you're so good because you work all things for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. God, you are so good because you didn't spare your own son, but sent him to die for us. Verse after verse after verse, these sixth graders offered heartfelt prayers to God, 
based on the word of God they were memorizing. They had meaty prayers. Whether they were fighting temptation or bad attitudes or making decisions and interacting with others, Bible-saturated children will have the memorized word of God to inform them. And even more, the memorized word is a powerful weapon. It really is a sword. And that sword is most useful and most accessible to their ch our children if they have it in their heads and in their hearts. So in an effort to encourage and support this strategy, Truth 78 has developed several resources to encourage and support Bible memory in the church and in the home. Foundation verses are starter memory verses for preschoolers. True 78 has also produced a set of 550 key verses that are especially helpful for fighting the fight of faith, and that's why we call them fighter verses. And we've witnessed significant growth in children and adults who invested the time and effort to memorize these verses. So, commitment number one, embrace a biblical vision for the discipleship of the next generation and take heart we're more than halfway through so there's six more to go and Sally's reminding me we really need to hurry so well let's hasten on the second commitment is proclaim the breadth and the depth of the whole counsel of God we did a whole conference on this reality or this priority um, in 2016 and you can go online and you can get some great talks uh, on that, this particular subject. So we want our children to have the full scope, the full understanding of God's not word, not just the little pieces. We, we want our children to know God as the sovereign one who chose a people for his own. We want him, them to know him as a rescuer who led his people out of Egypt. We want them to know God as a deliverer who opened the Red Sea and as a jealous one who judged idolatry at the feet of the golden calf with death and as a provider who fed his people with, breath and water, with bread and water in the wilderness and a victorious one who defeated all of the enemies of God and as a king who chose David to sit on the throne of Israel, and a judge who set Israel into exile, and a merciful one who led his people back to the promised land and rebuild the temple and the walls of Jerusalem, and the faithful one who fulfilled his promise to send a savior. We want them to know a God in all the full orb of his character, merciful and loving. We want them to know this God of the Bible, and they must see that God rather than the God of their own imaginations. We want our children to have a comprehensive explanation and understanding of God's redemptive work through Christ. To reduce the, the truth of the gospel down to a oversimplified concept that we think children can grasp uh, is like taking the story of Romeo and Juliet and reducing it down to two confused teenagers fall in love and die. If, if we keep the whole counsel of God from the next generation, they will grow up having a very anemic faith without any substance or meaning. If children never grow beyond a few simplistic Bible truths, such as Jesus loves us and God is good and Jesus died on the cross, for our sins, all of those glorious realities. But if, if we just give them those little sound bites, how will their faith stand strong when they're confronted by the skepticism of this age? Our zeal to proclaim the gospel to our children, in that zeal, we can often overlook or ignore the doctrinal foundations that lead to understanding, the understanding of the cross and how it solves our sin problem. The whole Bible instructs us in our need for salvation and how to live for the glory of God. Again, Timothy hears from Paul in this letter, all scripture is breathed out by God. All scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And so we want to be giving our children all the scripture. In fact, Paul understood the how critical it was that he do this, that he says 
to the Ephesian elders there in Acts 20, verse 26 and 7. He's there on the beach saying goodbye to the elders of this church, seeing them for the last time. He says, I'm innocent of your blood because I didn't shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Paul felt the weight of this responsibility and we should feel that responsibility as well. And we wrestled in this conference a few years ago, just what is that whole council? I mean, Paul's saying he would be guilty of their blood if he withheld that. What does it mean to say the whole, to teach the whole council of God? And this is D.A. Carson's effort to try to describe what the whole council means. He said, what he must mean is that he taught Paul, the burden of the whole of God's revelation, the balance of things, leaving nothing out that was of primary importance, never ducking the hard bits, helping believers to grasp the whole counsel of God that they themselves would become better equipped to read their Bibles intelligently and comprehensively. At Truth 78, we've identified five major categories that form the structure of our effort to impart the whole counsel of God's revelation to our children. Number one, a chronological overview of the Bible's key stories and themes. Two, a study of the Bible's historical redemptive narrative, which is often referred to as biblical theology. Number three, an examination of the essential doctrines of the Bible, otherwise known as systematic theology. Number four, God's moral or his ethical instruction And number five, an explicit and a careful study of the essential truths of the gospel. So, um, commitment, number two, teach the whole counsel of God. Number three, commitment, told you this would go faster. Uh, Number three, disciple the mind, the heart, and the will. The whole counsel of God is rooted in the three-dimensional love of God. Deuteronomy 6, you see those dimensions. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Or Jesus takes that great commandment and says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. We affirm the necessity of taking these three dimensions into serious consideration when we're discipling the next generation. We want to instruct the mind, we want to engage the heart, and we want to influence the will. So just let's look at those briefly. Number one, instruct the mind. God has revealed himself in the Bible, which communicates through words and concepts that first must be known and understood in the mind. The next generation must be taught rightly to read and to study and to apply those scriptures. They need to think critically and be able to reason in order to have confidence in God and to be able to defend their faith. The mind is what influences the other two dimensions of discipleship. Listen to Pastor Martin Lloyd-Jones. He puts it this way. The heart is always to be influenced through understanding, the mind, then the heart, then the will. But God forbid that anyone should think that it ends with the intellect. It starts there, but it goes on. It then moves the heart, and finally a man yields his will. Lloyd-Jones identifies this very important progression. First the mind, then the heart, than the will. We want that same pro- progression in the discipleship of our children. So the mind matters, but the heart, engaging the heart, is absolutely crucial. The heart matters. It matters, should matter to us. It certainly matters to Jesus. Jesus says in Matthew 15, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. Out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a man. And then a few verses earlier, Jesus quotes uh, the prophet, this people honors me with their lips 
but their hearts are far from me. In vain they worship me. You are worshiping God in vain if your heart is not engaged in worship. One of the dangers of children growing up in the church is that they can come to know the Bible. They know all the right answers to the questions that they're asked in Sunday school. And yet you can grow up knowing all the right answers, knowing the Bible inside and out, and never really love the truth, never really love the author of the truth. We can see this in Job's experience. Job knew about God, but after his trials and the revelation of God's glory through his experience, he says in chapter 42, verse 5, he says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now I see my eyes see you. And I would add, the eyes of my heart see you. This movement from head to heart is ultimately the work of God. However, God's spirit is pleased to accomplish that work through parents and teachers who not only instruct the mind, but engage the heart of the children. Sally's going to give us four ways that we can think about as we, we seek to engage the heart of our children. Well, one of the ways that we engage the heart is by applying the truths we are teaching to real life situations. You know, children don't always understand how to, the Bible applies to their lives. They need help to link the theoretical to the practical. They need to see the Bible as relevant and authoritative in every part of life, and Pastor Ryan talked about that last night. For example, we can guide a child who's having a conflict with his brother by ask, simply asking a question like, what does the Bible say about how you should respond to your brother? Applying the Bible in practical life situations provides fertile soil for faith to take root and grow. So we must not miss this opportunity every day. Children, for example, there's, you may have a child who's nervous about a piano recital. And she says, Mom, I'm scared about playing in front of all those people. I'm afraid I'm going to forget my peace. Now, there are two kinds of responses you could give. The first one is this, Susie, you practice very hard, and you really play your piece well. You might be nervous, but when you get up there, your fingers will remember what to do. Just concentrate on playing the piano and forget about the people. I know you'll do just fine. Now, that might be reassuring, but it does not impart the words of life. It doesn't turn a child to God. It points the child to herself. So here's another way of responding. Susie, I know that you are nervous, and I'm going to give you a verse to hang on to. Psalm 125, 1 and 2. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken and endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forevermore. Do you know what that verse means? You can go up to that piano and trust in your ability and how much you practiced and that is all that you will have to trust in. Or you can go up to that piano, trusting in the God of the whole universe. You can walk up to that piano and say, Jesus, I am trusting in you. I am in your hands. Place my hands in your hands today. And you play that piano piece knowing that God is on your side. And no matter what happens, no matter how you play that piece, if you are trusting in God, you will not be shaken. You will stand strong and firm. And the loving arms of God will be all around you, just like the mountains surround Jerusalem. He will be in front of you and behind you and on your right side and on your left side. He will surround you with his love as you play that piano. So when you play that piano, you play it for him. Not to show off your ability or to entertain the audience, but as a way of saying, thank you, Jesus, for being with me. That imparts words of life. That points that child to God and not to herself and her ability. Another God-given way to engage the heart and influence the will of students is to encourage them to actively interact with the truth. When children are actively learning, their minds are interacting with the subject matter. They're thinking, discovering, imagining, questioning, organizing, analyzing, evaluating, drawing conclusions, and applying the material. If we just sit children down and tell them what to believe, they may not be comprehending, they may not be agreeing with or internalizing the truth. We want them to be able to look up a text in the Bible, carefully observe, 
and rightly interpret that text, make real life application of the truth of their own lives, and eventually respond in faith to it. We want them to embrace it, to own it, to live by it, and to be willing to die for it. So by taking children and youth logically through a series of questions designed to lead them to the right conclusions, we're encouraging them to discover what God actually says in his word. So our, que our questions should teach them to observe, to interpret, and to apply the truth. The mind then becomes a conduit for the truth to reach the heart. So then, practically, how do we do this? I think we start by asking questions that will lead children to draw biblical conclusions which are linked to practical application in a child's life. Now, you can do that even with a preschooler. For example, you're teaching the preschoolers the story of Nebuchadnezzar eating grass like a cow. You start by asking questions. For preschool, you're going to ask something obvious like, do people eat grass? And the children, of course, will say no. And as we tell the story, we ask questions along the way to make sure they're understanding the main points. Then we make application by asking questions that help children to see the connection between their own lives and the Bible. For example, Nebuchadnezzar said, look at this great city I have made. Nebuchadnezzar thought he built that city all by himself. He forgot about God. He didn't thank God for helping him to build the city. Do you ever forget to thank God? Did you thank him for your breakfast today? Do you thank him for strong legs and arms? Notice how I start by asking questions about the story, and then I want them to discover how that truth applies to their own lives. By asking a question like, do you ever forget to thank God? In this manner, the mind becomes a conduit for truth to reach the heart. For older children, of course, you're going to ask more thought-provoking questions. It's going to encourage them to discover important concepts and lead them to draw conclusions. And ultimately, we want them to answer the question, how does this apply to me? How does God want me to respond to this? They need, they need to walk out of that Sunday school room. They need to walk away from a discussion with you, a conversation with a parent saying, I know what God wants me to do. I know what the Bible says about what I should be as a Christian. As parents and children's workers, we need to actively look for these opportunities to link the Bible to life experience and then use those teachable moments for the glory of God and the instruction of their hearts. Several years ago, a child in our church was learning about the providence of God in the True 78 curriculum, My Purpose Will Stand. And that year he grew pretty tall and he was too small for his bike. And the family didn't have money to buy another bike, and so he was just going to have to use this too small bike. And they got home and had a message on the answering machine that Grandma wanted to buy him a bike. Um, the mom knew what this boy had been learning in Sunday school, and she said, simple question, why do you think that happened? Why did gr Grandma want to buy you a bike? And this boy stopped, and he thought, and he said, oh! It's the providence of God. God knew I needed a bike, and he encouraged Grandma to get one. Now, did you notice what happened? Gratitude is transferred from Grandma to God where it rightly belongs. She was only a tool in his hand. God was the one that provided that bike. And that child responded to God with affection and worship. A third way to engage the heart is by encouraging a response to the truth being taught. When we teach children, we always want to have their hearts in view. We want to teach in such a way that when we lead, we lead them to see what response the Word of God requires. We want them to see the relationship between the Word and their own lives. And the goal should be that they know how to act on the Word of God. We want them to be able to answer the question, what do I do in response to what I've heard? What is God asking of me? A number of years ago, I taught a lesson from um, the curriculum, Fight the Good Fight. And the lesson explains how to fight a spirit of fear by showing the practical relationship of biblical principles to the child's life. A few weeks after the teaching the lesson, a fifth grade boy came up to me and he said, Mrs. Michael, I was lying in bed one night and I was really scared. Then I remembered what you said about fighting the fight of faith. So I said a fighter verse. And then I said another, and then I said another, and pretty soon I wasn't afraid anymore. 
Guess what, Mrs. Michael? Fighting the fight of faith really works. That's a child acting on the truth he's been taught, and God meeting him when he acted on the truth. Fourth, reaching the heart of a child is influenced by the heart of the teacher. Deuteronomy 6, 6-7, these words I'm giving you today shall be on your hearts. Teach them to your children. Consider these words from Lou Priolo and teach them diligently. There is no effective shortcut to studying the Bible for yourself. To rely solely on someone else's preparation for God, of God's word for your children is to neglect the first part of Deuteronomy 6.6. 6. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. Someone has said that a message prepared in a mind reaches a mind, but a message prepared in a life reaches a life. In other words, the more of God's word you've internalized for yourself, the more effectively you'll be able to properly indoctrinate your children in the scripture. The way you authentically lead the children to see the response that the word of God is asking of them is, and encourage them to make that response is first to live that scripture yourself. And then you're going to teach on the overflow of your heart. It's going to require careful reflection of the Bible passage. It means looking at the Bible lesson a week at least before you're going to teach it, asking the Lord, make this real in my life. How do you want me to live this out? And then you're teaching from the overflow of your heart as you ask God to change you through his word. Number four, influence the will. The evidence of a true saving faith from the heart is a growing desire to walk in obedience to God. David sings in Psalm 40, verse 8, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Paul tells us in Romans 2, 13, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will, who will be justified. And of course, you know James 1, 22, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 15, and again says in verse 21, He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. I was teaching fifth and sixth grade from Psalm 72 from the, the curriculum, Pour Out Your Heart Before Him. And the lesson explains the consequences of hiding our sin and the freedom and the forgiveness that comes through confession of sin. And all of these truths will be discovered by underlining words in the text to discover the meaning, following the train of thought, defining words, asking questions, finding the answers, recording the truth in the student notebook. And, and I was moved to ask during the lesson, has anyone had an experience of hiding sin? And can you tell us about it and the result of hiding sin? And one boy, I'm talking about a sixth grade boy, he raises his hand and he taught, told us about a fishing contest he was in. And he had caught two fish, but he had reported that he had caught three fish. And he received a trophy for catching three fish. He understood that he had cheated and he had lied. So I asked him, I said, well, what was the result of covering up your sin? And he said, every time I look at that trophy, I feel guilty. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. I said, you don't have to live with that guilt. We talked about the blessing, that feeling of guilt is, that it causes us and leads us to repentance. We talked about how to be free from sin through confession and what steps he needed to take. And he was ready to take those steps and be free from the guilt and the penalty of sin. And that wasn't a lesson just for that boy. It was a lesson for that whole class. You could have heard a pin drop in that room. Truth is taken in through the mind. It moves to the heart. And then it engages the will. Number four, commitment. I'm just going to mention this briefly. A robust partnership between the church and the home. A robust partnership between the church and the home. So we're persuaded at True 78 that there are two institutions that God has established for the discipleship of the next generation. The home and the church. And within the church, there is discussion about is one of those more responsible than the other and you will find in churches those who think mainly it's the church so parents you raise them you feed them you clothe them you give them a good education and you take them to church for discipleship 
Another mindset is, no, thank you very much, church. Parents are responsible. You're going to have to give an account for the discipleship of your children. Therefore, um, stay out of our business, church. This is our responsibility. And we just want to affirm both institutions. In fact, moving away, we used to say uh, parents are primarily responsible. No, both the church and parents are responsible for the discipleship of the next generation. Both will have to give an account for faithfulness to God. Our responsibilities uh, are carried out differently in the church. There are assets that the church has in the discipleship of the children that are not available in the home. And parents have opportunities, like what we've just been talking about, uh, not only for instruction, but for this application to the heart and to the will. Parents have opportunities every single day to influence the heart and influence the will. Both, though, are going to have to give an account to God. And so this um, commitment we have is to a partnership between these two institutions, and we should coordinate our efforts and move our children toward the same goal. So we want to foster that and encourage that. Number five, we want to instruct our children with gospel hope in Christ alone. We not want to never lose sight of the fact that heaven is real and glorious and hell is real and it's dreadful. The eternal destination of our children is at stake. And therefore, Jesus and the gospel is very precious. One text of scripture that has fueled my prayer and has sustained my vision for the next generation over these years comes out of Matthew 25. It's the story of the talents, and you've got the three servants who stand before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and they hear one of two responses. Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master, or away from me. I never knew you. And looking into the faces of our children, knowing one day those eyes will look into the face of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and their ears will hear one of two responses. Well done, or get away from me. I never knew you. And want our kids to hear, well done, good and faithful servants. Um, John Engel James, a pastor in the late 1700s, early 1800s, in fact, in that generation, they just understood these things with such more, more fervency than I think we often experience. And I just want to read the first portion of this quote. We'll skip the whole thing for the sake of, or part of it for the sake of time here. But listen to what he says. This is in a book that he wrote for girls called Female Piety. And uh, this statement really applies well to both genders. He says, my subject is re religion. My object is the soul. I love that. Okay. We're talking about religion in Sunday school. We're talking about faith. But my target is your soul, kids. My aim is salvation. I view you, my female friends, as destined for another world. And it's my business to aid and stimulate you by patient continuance in well-doing to seek for glory and honor and immortality and to obtain eternal life. I look beyond the painted and gaudy scene of earth's fading vanities to the everlasting ages through which you must exist in torment or bliss. And God helping me, it shall not be my fault if you do not live in comfort, die in peace, and inherit salvation. John Uncle James understood that he was accountable to God. And by the grace of God, it's not going to be my fault if you perish in hell because I'm going to be faithful to show you the way that leads to life. So 
our teaching must be not only God-centered, it must be gospel-focused. We see that gospel focus in verse 7 of Psalm 78. The reason we're instructing our children is so that they shall set their hope in God. And that hope is resting on the death, life, I'm sorry, it should go the other way, the perfect life, death, and resurrection of God's Son, Jesus Christ. The hope that we want our children to set their hope in is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So often, children will just pick up bits and pieces of gospel truth without really understanding the wider scope of the gospel. And we want them to get the whole gospel as we instruct them in the truth. So gospel-focused teaching has a twofold approach. One, it has to clearly articulate the essential truths of the gospel and then the necessary response of true repentance and faith in Christ alone. God is sovereign. He's the creator and ruler. We're accountable to him. God is holy. He requires his people to be holy. We are desperately sinful and deserve God's eternal judgment. We're completely helpless to save ourselves. God is merciful. He's made a way for sinners to be saved through the death and resurrection of his son. We can't just jump to the cross before they understand the problem. You have to understand your plight before you can recognize the rescue, John Piper says. This is sobering news, but it's news our children must hear. And then secondly, gospel-focused teaching must communicate the essence of gospel living. Um, It's not just about conversion, it's about following Jesus. What it means to daily walk with Jesus, denying our selfish desires, living for Jesus, daily trusting him, submitting to his commands, depending on the Holy Spirit, putting sin to death, growing in holiness, honoring and treasuring God, and most of all, God has given us a rich and a glorious gospel to proclaim. Let's not hide it, diminish it, or water it down. Let's be careful not to lose the message of all in all of our state-of-the-art, high-tech, entertainment-oriented programming. How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? We have a glorious message, and embracing that message is the only hope the next generation has for salvation. As parents and ministry leaders, let's not lose sight to the fact that our children are born dead in their trespasses and sins. And the Bible says that no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. Ultimately, the salvation of God's children is in God, uh, our children is in God's hands, and therefore we must trust God to accomplish the spirit-wrought, grace-dependent transformation in the lives of our children. We labor with our hearts to faithfully and prayerfully guide them, but it is God as we, that uses our exhortation toward a, a personal and sincere response. So commitment number six, pray with confidence in God. To raise a child is serious responsibility. The application of the gospel of our children is a miracle we cannot perform. So. We cannot raise our children from spiritual death. No one comes to the Father except through me. The salvation of children is in God's hand. So prayer is crucial. We cannot be fooled into thinking that it's our methods that saves our children. It's not our methods. It's the message inspired by the Holy Spirit and brought to fruition by him. Children can know the gospel, but it can't make them alive in Christ. In the words of Psalm 78, we can faithfully pass the truth on to our children and make his mighty deeds known to them, but we cannot make them set their hope in God. And remember what Jesus said to the young ruler, what is impossible with men is possible with God. The discipleship of the next generation is impossible apart from the grace of God. Let's keep in mind that even Jesus felt compelled to pray for his disciples. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. So we've got resources for you, praying for the next generation, big, bold biblical prayers, a father's guide to his children. Number seven, we want to inspire our children to worship God for the glory of God. We've been entrusted with a testimony We've been charged with a responsibility to pass that truth on. 
about God and his works and on to the next generation. And uh, it would be a mistake if we overlook a very important word in verse 4 of Psalm 78. We're not only to pass this truth on, but to note that this truth is glorious. It is a record of God's glorious deeds, and glorious deeds call for praise. We, we saw in, in verse 7, we're doing this, all of this, so that our children will put their confidence in God. There's more, one more ultimate aim. Not only will they put their confidence in God, put their confidence in God for his glory. That's why we were all created, is for the glory of God. And he makes that passion of his known throughout the word. But let me just read one, Isaiah 43, 6 and 7. He says, bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, who I have created for my glory, whom I formed and I made. So if you want to know what God's will is for your, your life, it is to glorify God in everything that you do. And yet, so often, we can unwittingly hide the glory of God from our children. We saw earlier how we hide him as the main character of the Bible, but we also hide his glory from our children. The story of Elijah and the widow is not merely a story about a poor widow who has no money for food and only a little jar of oil. It's not merely about Elijah who told her to ask all her neighbors to empty for empty jars. It's not merely about her filling up all the jars from the oil in her jar. It's not a story about jars. It's not a story about oil, but the widow had no money for food. All she had was a little jar of oil. That is a big problem. But God knew about the widow and the oil. Is this problem too hard for God? No, nothing is too hard for God. God knew just what to do. He would send the widow to Elisha. Elisha would tell her to borrow jars from all her neighbors. What would God do with all those empty jars? God would fill them up with one little tiny jar of oil. The widow started to pour the oil. She filled up one jar but there was still oil in the little jar. She filled up another jar, but there was still oil in the little jar. She filled up a great big empty jar and there was still oil in the little jar. How can that be? God did it. God is great. God can do anything. God can make more and more and more oil. It's not merely only a boy named David only a little sling, only a boy named David, but he could pray and sing. Only a boy named David, only a rippling brook, only a boy named David, and five little stones he took. And one little stone went in the sling, and the sling went round and round. And one little stone went in the sling, and the sling went round and round. And round and round and round and round and round and round and round. And one little stone went up in the air, and the giant came tumbling down. But the whole army of Israel was afraid of Goliath. But God didn't need a big army to defeat Goliath. God can do anything, and to show Israel that he can do anything, God used a boy with a sling and a stone to kill a giant. Dave, God sent David to face the giant. God gave David, per, get, David swung his sling around and around, and God gave David perfect aim. And God sent that stone right into Goliath's head. The stone of God killed the giant Goliath. Nothing is too hard for God. He always defeats his enemies. So what's, what happens in your heart when you hear the story told that way? There's something that's happening inside you that just wants to get out, something that wants to sing. Scratch another back, scratch the back next to you. Scratch another back as you sing this song. Scratch another back, scratch the back next to you. Scratch another back as we sing. Sing this song. 
That's not what's happening in your heart at that moment, isn't it? You were made for worship. Our God is so big. Oh, that's what. Our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are his, the rivers are his, the stars in the sky are his too. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. That's, that's a heart that wants to worship this God, and we rob him of his glory if we talk about scratching backs and and other things, and just, we need to <laughs> draw out of our kids worship. And the way you do that is by how you tell the story of God's greatness. So more that we could say, but let's just, um, I hope you've gotten a taste of just this vision that's undergirding everything that we do at Truth 78. And we really invite you to join us in pursuing this Psalm 78 vision for the next generation, that you would be a Psalm 78 person, a Psalm 78 church or organization that would embrace a biblical vision for the faith of the next generation. A, a church that, an individual that would proclaim the breadth and depth of the whole counsel of God, that we would disciple the mind, the heart, and the will, that we would foster a robust partnership between church and home, that we would instruct our children with the gospel hope in Christ alone, that we would pray with confidence in God, and that we would inspire the worship of God for the glory of God. And so uh, we encourage you to just join us in this effort and help us. I would just love to build this network of churches who care about such things. Um, in that email that's going out to you at the end of the day today, there'll, there'll be an opportunity. If you'd like us to kind of keep you in the loop on this idea of this network, uh, there'll be a place for you to check that as well as to give us some good feedback on either this or anything else from this conference. So as Brian comes up, let me uh, pray for us. Father, we do thank you that you've given us your word, that we're not left to ourselves to try to navigate this world and this life on this side of heaven in the dark, but that you've shown us through the light of your word. And I pray that you would keep us faithful in passing the light of this truth on to the next generation. Thank you for these brothers and sisters and for their responsive hearts as we've shared today. And Lord, I just pray that you would give us all the desire of our heart for the next generation. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.